you off here. I want to say welcome to our church family. It is good to be together. And uh, uh, I would encourage you to join me in the book of Esther this morning as we turn there, the book of Esther. And uh, what we have uh, uh, help you find this little book. Sometimes it can be hard to find those smaller books in the Old Testament. And so if you um, are in the Job and Psalms kind of direction, it's just before Job and right after Nehemiah. That may help you pin it down. And you'll notice in your bulletin that there is a, a sheet with some uh, various outlines or, or space for some notes. And, and this is just some, a tool that may or may not be helpful for you. And um, throughout this series, you're going to see something like this. And, and one side is kind of specifically designed for the kids. And, and so uh, just a, a little way to help out there. And, um, and the other side for, for whoever would want to use that as well. So those are available. The, there's some others at the back there. Oh, hi. Heidi's got some in her hand at the moment. If someone wants some, just slip up your hand and she would get those to you. But uh, those will just be available. You, you'll be able to grab those and make use of them throughout this time. <clears throat> well, let's bow together for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can sing songs of uh, worship and adoration as we seek to exalt you and as we rehearse the, the wonderful truths of the gospel that, that are near and dear to our hearts as believers. And so as we gather today, as we take this time now to open the word together, I pray that you would work in our midst through the Holy Spirit, that, that in, these, um, in these verses that are before us, that we would be challenged afresh about who you are and, and about uh, the wonderful work of, of salvation that has been accomplished and how you want us to live our lives as your followers. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us insight into these things. Uh, and it may be that there's some here today who are, are weighed down by many things. And uh, whatever those needs are within our heart, we ask for you, Lord, to meet those needs, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The first part of what we're going to do is going to seem like a little bit of a history class here uh, because we're going to look at these, this little book uh, called Esther and uh, just talk about a few things from it. So I've got a few uh, notes on the PowerPoint just to kind of get the first part and, and then... Uh, and then we'll just look into the words of Scripture itself uh, to guide us. But in this book that we're covering, that we're talking about, the book of Esther, it happens in history, uh, 483 B.C. to 473, during the Persian period of world history. And uh, that's kind of what we have there. As we look that into, into biblical history, um, what God has done is he has rescued his people from slavery in Egypt and he brought them into the promised land. But he warned them that if they continually turned away from him, what he would do would be to allow other nations to capture them and take away the freedoms that they enjoyed. And, and we see this pattern repeated a number of times in Scripture in a number of ways. And there's a couple of big moments when this sort of thing happened. There was, uh, in 722 B.C., the Assyrian captivity. And then in uh, 605 B.C., the Babylonian captivity. So what that basically was, was um, other nations going in to the land of Israel, and to the Jerusalem, and, and taking people away, removing them from their homes, and uh, removing the freedoms, removing them from just being able to live as they pleased. And that uh, was God's way of judging his own people. 
a little bit of that uh, correction that we talked about from Hebrews 12, that, that God would, he loves us so much he would not allow his people to continue uh, down a wrong path without him stepping in and intervening. So um, you've got this 70-year Babylonian captivity, and then uh, at the end of that, there are many Jewish people who returned to their homeland. So after it was over, they could come back. This happened in a few stages. There was a first return, uh, 538 BC, led by Zerubbabel, recorded in Ezra 1 through 6. A second return, uh, 458 BC, led by Ezra, recorded in Ezra 7 through 10. A third return, uh, 445 BC, led by Nehemiah, uh, recorded in Nehemiah 1 through 13. Now, the events of Esther that we're going to be looking at, they take place between the first and second return. And uh, if you were to go to Ezra, we won't uh, turn there right now, but um, Ezra 6 and then Ezra 7, kind of right in between that period uh, of biblical history would be where these events happen. Now, on a, a little map, if you've got uh, Jerusalem, kind of um, lower left corner, or, or let me use this map, pointing there to Jerusalem, and then the Babylonian Empire. So you've got uh, the people of Israel scattered around throughout that Babylonian Empire. And then way over here in Susa, our our the events that we're talking about in the book of Esther. So they're a long way from their home. And uh, while they're there, uh, a, lot of thing, a lot of life happens away from home. And maybe that's a little bit of your story too, but that certainly is what was happening as they, uh, they were in a different place with different people ruling over them. And... Uh, looking forward to a day when they could return. So we've got some main characters in this particular uh, book of Esther, and we'll be referring to them as, as we go on. Uh, Esther, the main individual, uh, her Hebrew name, Hadassah. And then we've got Mordecai, who is a cousin of Esther, but kind of becomes, uh, because she uh, has been orphaned, uh, he kind of becomes that individual who, who is a father figure to her and helps her, guides her. Uh, scripture tells us that he, he treated her as his own daughter. So there's a unique relationship there. Uh, Mordecai plays an important role in this book as well. Then you've got a, a bad dude, a bad dude by the name of Haman, and we will encounter some things about him. And we will actually learn some, some good lessons from an evil guy. Um, we, can, we can do that. We can learn. Um, then there's this, uh, this king. And uh, Isaac and Natalie, you did, you did great uh, reading scripture this morning. I, I, um, I, I butcher so many names in the Old Testament because I don't know proper pronunciation. I'm going to call this guy Ahasuerus, uh, King Ahasuerus, and uh, some, depending on your translation, you'll see a couple of different names for him. So one is Ahasuerus, and that would be the Hebrew uh, way to say his name, and then Xerxes, which is a, a Greek uh, way of his name. And so you've got different languages going on, and that's why sometimes in Scripture, you'll see the same person referred to by a couple of different names. Well, often it's because of, of a, a different language being brought into the situation. So this isn't a new thing. We deal with this. So my name in English is Peter. Uh, my name in French would be uh, Pierre. Uh, my name in Greek would be Petros. Uh, my name in Italian would be Pasta Pete. Uh, yeah, I just made that up. Yeah. 
But anyway, uh, the other main character, the main main character is God in the book of Esther. Now, it's especially interesting because when you read the book of Esther, you cannot actually find God's name in that book. And so that's one of the things that at various times has kind of caused uh, various people throughout history to say, does, does the book of Esther even belong in Scripture? And it's very clear that it does belong in Scripture. Um, you, 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 you don't have to go very far before you see God's hand at work. And you see a, a number of things. You see his leading. You, you see his protection. Because we've got a group of people who are going to face some very difficult things. And yet God is going to protect them in that. We see his sovereignty and that he is in complete control. He is not surprised by these events. And he is in charge. And we will also see his deliverance. He takes what seems to be uh, impending death upon a great number of people and he delivers them from that. Now these are all aspects that are part of God's character. And we could go to uh, almost any place in scripture to see and hear uh, God acting in this same way that he acts in Esther. So it is very consistent with God's character. So we don't need to doubt whether this is inspired scripture or not. It, it is, and it is so clear to see his hand at work in this process. And so um, in this book called Esther. But we do then look to uh, some other verses to help us put it in the framework uh, to help us understand. So here's, here's one example. Psalm 64 says, Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked. So if you... If you know the end of the story, if you already know uh, what is involved in Esther, you've got a, a number of these things. You've got enemies, you've got secret plots, uh, you've got very wicked plans, and you've got God who does preserve his people in that and from that. And another reminder from Psalm 3, salvation belongs to the Lord, your blessing be on your people. So God is the one who truly saves and delivers. And ultimately, this book of Esther points us to him. So when we think of how you and I as sinful people, uh, lost in our sin, needed deliverance, and God, through his great love for us, sent Jesus to be our Savior, our Redeemer, our Deliverer. And so the picture of salvation truly um, points to himself, and you can see that same pattern in the book of Esther, uh, the pattern of deliverance. All right, so that is the history lesson, and that's as far as those notes go. So it's time for the remaining portion of our time this morning. Let's dig into the Word of God itself. And I have one particular question to uh, put before us as we look at these verses. And I want us to ask the question, who is in charge? Who is in charge? <coughs> Excuse me. Beginning at verse 3, if you would. In the third year of his reign, he... King Ahasuerus gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and the governors of the provinces were before him. While he showed 
the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, a hundred and eighty days. Let's pause there for a moment. So you have the king who, as it tells us, puts his riches on display. Do you notice the words that are used here? We've got riches, royal glory, splendor, pomp, greatness, all of these words used to show his exalted position as a king. And just as you might have a, a great exhibit, for example, if, if they find some uh, incredible uh, artifact, let's say uh, a rare dinosaur uh, skeleton shows up somewhere in the ground and they recover that and, and they put it on display in a prominent place at a museum or somewhere so that people can come and look at it from every angle and They'll write up a story about it. Well, here we have the king in his kingdom, and, and they're so successful, he sees himself as so powerful that he puts on this great display, this festival, this big fair, this big exhibit, so that everyone can come and go, ooh, and ah. Can you say that with me? Ooh, ah, wonderful. And, and, and everyone is so impressed by what is taking place. Wow, what a great king we must have. And so I think we would answer the question of who is in charge. We would, we would say, well, obviously the king. And no one is greater than him, we would say. It would seem they spend 180 days having this great celebration. Then, verse 5, seems they're not done yet. When these days were completed, they all went back home to their regular lives. No, it tells us the king gave for all the people present in Susa the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So they're not just displaying things any longer. <clears throat> they're saying, let's continue with the things, but let's bring in the food and the drink to be a part of it. So for seven days, it's this incredible celebration. And then it says in verse 7, drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, the royal Wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. And drinking was according to this edict. There was no compulsion. For the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Stopping there. Well, it would seem the king is in charge, but now he's also told people they can pretty much do what they want. The alcohol is there. It's interesting that it says no compulsion. It, 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 it almost implies that there would be certain events that the king uh, held where you were required to drink. Not, not sure, but there's almost that implication there. But in this case, he's not forcing anyone, but boy, if you want it, you can have all you want. And there is a sense in which there's, there's freedom for everyone to, to have what they want in terms of the alcohol. Go for it. Enjoy it, is the idea. So yes, while the king was still in charge, it seems now he's given a measure of that control to individuals at this grand party that they have. Now, it makes a note here in verse 9 that Queen Vashti also had a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Ahasuerus. So it would seem that there was the, the overall feast was happening, but then a, a special feast for the ladies as well. So they're drinking it up, they're eating it up, they're having a great time. And as time goes on, 
And as the alcohol uh, is used in all sorts of ways, then uh, things become a little freer. And so at a particular point, it tells us in verse 10, on the seventh day, at the end of this time, the, the heart of the king was merry with wine. So he commanded, <laughs> you think I'm going to read those names? I'm not. Uh, yeah. He commanded all those guys, um, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king, to, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But the queen refused, it tells us in verse 12. She refused to come at the king's command. And that angered the king. So let's go back to the question of who's in charge. We thought it was the king. Apparently it's the queen. The king gives the command... We want you to come. Now, you know, we're not really told the circumstances here, but it does mention he wanted her to come because she was good to look at, to, to be paraded, it would seem, in front of all of these drunken guys. And so I personally think that the queen was very appropriate to refuse this request. But you can't just do that to, to a king without repercussion. The king is used to getting whatever he wants, whenever he wants. And now, the queen, not just anyone, but the queen has said, no. And at this, the king became enraged, according to verse 12. His anger burned within him. So this guy who thinks he's in charge can't get what he wants in the moment. And he's explosive in his anger then. Wow. Well, uh, time goes on. They, his... Uh, they, they deal with that, and uh, they, his anger subsides a bit, but they do have a predicament that they have to work through. And you can read the rest of the chapter, but his wise counsel guys are saying, you cannot just let the queen get away with this, because all over the kingdom then, when husbands ask or tell their wives to do something, there's some cultural things here, okay, that they will refuse all over the place because of what the queen's example has been. They say, we can't have that. So if the, if the king's control is being threatened, he's got to up it. He's got to stay in control. So the way they do that, of course, uh, Queen Vashti disappears. They now are on the hunt for a new queen. King who de is determined to keep control, to keep everyone else under his thumb. And he's not going to let it slip away from him. So they make a decree uh, that all the uh, let me jump to verse 20. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all the kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king. That matter was dealt with. All right, now let's find a new wife. Chapter 2. Needs a new queen. The young women are to come and gather. And there's a young lady by the name of Esther, who comes on the scene. And she then goes through the process, and it's quite a process, you can read about it in chapter 2, of how she becomes selected. Months and months of preparation go into this, and she's presented to the king, and if the king likes what he sees, he finds a new queen. Esther 
doesn't seem to have any say in the matter. It seems pretty clear as you read through chapter 2, she doesn't really have a choice in this matter. She's not in charge. And so she is swept along with it and does what is required of her. Let me pick it up just so you get a sense of of what's going on. Uh, Verse 7 talks about uh, Mordecai. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. When her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody. And then they begin to prepare her. And jump to verse 15. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter, to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight, more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. And so we have a new queen chosen through this person of Esther. And we're going to get to know her a little bit more in the days ahead. Uh, Before we leave chapter 2, I just draw your attention to those last verses. uh, Beginning at verse 19. Because there's a plot that happens. Someone wants to take out the king. And here's the pattern. A pattern is being set. Because Mordecai finds out about this plan. He tells Esther. Esther tells the king. And uh, bad stuff is stopped from happening. That's a pattern that we're going to see again. Okay, So it's a little... It's an event that happens here, but it's certainly foreshadowing what is to happen in days ahead. And so just an interesting note. As we uh, draw this to a close this morning, because we're just really giving the, laying the groundwork for the rest of the study, we still have to answer that question of who is in charge, because so far it seems as though the king is the one who's in charge. And is that just the way it's going to be? Whatever the king says goes in all circumstances? Is that just the way it is? In your life? Who's in charge? Is it your boss? Is it your mom? Is it your dad? Is it the government? And all of these individuals have certain roles. And there are certain authorities. But is that our highest authority? Or maybe the highest authority is yourself. Maybe you're your own boss. You're in charge of you. How do we deal with this? What do we do about this? Let me turn your attention to a couple of spots. We're close uh, in time frame here to to Daniel. If you can flip over... um, Head deeper toward the end of the Old Testament, and you'll find Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel reminds us of something here. 
<clears throat> uh, and this is, in a sense, a, a testimony uh, toward God. But in Daniel 2 and verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. And here we go. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Do you see in, the, in that verse, we are mindful that there can be kings, there can be rulers and leaders, but there's someone else above them. Someone who can either put them in that position or take them out of that position. And who is that? Well, it is the God of the Bible. The God that we speak of. The God who clearly is directing the events uh, that happen in Esther. There is not one move that King Ahasuerus can, can make without God first allowing that to happen. Without God first enabling that in certain ways. Without God directing and guiding. And though Ahasuerus may not be a godly man, God uses evil individuals even to accomplish his purposes. The last passage that I draw your attention to this morning would be in Psalm 33. So come with me to Psalm 33. <clears throat> Psalm 33, beginning, I think I'll, I'll begin at verse uh, 6 of Psalm 33. <clears throat> By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. So again, God is above all. You can have your kingdoms, you can have your authorities, but God can in a moment bring all of that down because he is the absolute supreme authority. He is God. And so the question I leave you with today, who is in charge of your life? You and I, don't do very well when we're trying to control and take charge of our lives. We do much better when we submit to His authority. There may be some things that you're struggling with. You're, you're having a hard time trusting God with. You're having a hard time letting Him lead. I think you'll see in the book of Esther that it was hard for Esther at times, it was hard for Mordecai at times to trust that God would deal with this situation. And yet that's what he was calling them to do. That's what he's calling us to do too. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for just an introduction into this book. And thank you for the work that you are doing. Thank you that you are in charge, that there's nobody else who can take you off of your throne. There's no plans and schemes that, that people can come up with that will uh, thwart your purposes. And so, Lord, help us to place our trust where it belongs, in you. Help us not to have confidence in the flesh or in 
institutions or individuals around us, but to place our confidence in you. And so we pray for you to give us strength for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.